The Industrial Revolution saw Britain become one of the most powerful nations on Earth. Some of our best-known engineers heralded a new era of design with their world-class bridges. Isambard Kingdom Brunel brought us the revolutionary Clifton Suspension Bridge, while Robert Stevenson's high-level bridge in Newcastle was hot on the heels of Thomas Telford's incredible Manaya Suspension Bridge, all setting the benchmark for today's engineers and designers to surpass. And we continue to create world firsts with awe-inspiring bridges across the land. But how do we do it? And what does it take to build these lasting legacies? Cities are defined by bridges. You can ask anybody in the street and they're probably more likely to be able to name a bridge in a city than a building in a city. It's not just a functional crossing of the river. It's actually, it's more than that. Gateshead Millennium Bridge in the northeast of England is a perfect example of cutting edge British design. It holds the record for being the first and only tilting bridge in the world. A magnificent feat of British engineering. This 800 ton steel giant is 50 meters high and is wider than a football pitch. Taking just two years to build and costing 22 million pounds, this unique structure has won more than 30 international awards. There are six bridges within half a mile along the River Tyne all defining the city of Newcastle. So in 1996, a competition was launched to build a world-class bridge that would put Gateshead firmly on the map. The moment that we understood that there was going to be a bridge competition, we were convinced that we had to win this competition, that it couldn't go anywhere else. We had to bridge this river. The key requirements of the bridge was firstly respond to the context. It had to respond to the existing bridges, the historic setting, the beautiful historic setting that, that we have. The second was to actually create an icon for the uh, millennium and create and help create and catalyse the regeneration on both sides of the, the riverbank. Our very strong intent was to create a destination. This was the catalyst for an arts-led regeneration programme. And yet, the number of people that came to stand on the bridge, so the bridge became not a connector, it became a destination. And that was a very strong intent at the outset. The designers had a challenge on their hands. The bridge had to open to allow for traffic along the river. Traditionally, bridges can be raised for this, but the winning design broke new ground by tilting the structure instead. Also, the bridge couldn't interfere with the quayside. Due to these constraints, a straight bridge over the river simply wouldn't work. If we actually curb the walkway, that gives you a longer path length, so it means you can actually get higher up over the river at the, at the specified gradients. So that was the starting point of the bridge, curved walkway. One of the really fascinating things about bridge design is that there are only so many types. There's a very limited palette for the designer to work in. So we're constantly looking for ways to reinterpret those well-known, well-understood types. The designers wanted to break the traditional mould and come up with a concept that was to be the first of its kind. It's the sort of holy grail of bridge design in some senses to create the new type. So I thought, well, what about a pair of arches? And what about rotating that like a visor on a motorcycling helmet or like the blink of an eye? This innovative rotating movement had never been done before. The design was truly original. I think we realised at that point that that was the eureka moment, its potential to be a winning solution. This new concept, where the whole bridge form rotates about a common pivot point mounted on each end, is unique and yet simple. It caught the imagination of the public and they duly voted it the winner, and rightly so. This is another record for British engineering, the first and only bridge in the world to tilt. The Millennium Bridge also became the first opening bridge to span the Tyne for 100 years. From winning, the challenge was then delivery uh, to a very tight timescale, uh, because it had to be finished by the Millennium. And very quickly, actually, we brought on board a contracting team. And they, too, had that passion and commitment to actually help deliver something which is unique, something which would celebrate the millennium. The main components are steel and concrete, and obviously then the hydraulic rams that, that form the bridge. The construction, which is the, the box section and the arch, had to be of a box section to make it light enough to work. There's about 800 tonnes in the bridge total, so it couldn't be too heavy, or the rams themselves would have to be massive to push it. So it was getting something that looked very, very nice, very aesthetic on the eye, but something very practical and, and, and would work. 
The bridge is made of two huge parabolic steel arches, one forming the deck and the other supporting it, and they sit on concrete islands on either side of the river. On each island are bearings with pins passing through them. These connect to the base of the arch and allow the bridge to rotate through 40 degrees. Deep inside the concrete end supports is what we call a paddle, which drops down from these pin points, uh, drops down vertically from these point, pin points, and to which are attached a bank of hydraulic rams, uh, three either side. In order to open the bridge, these hydraulic rams extend very slowly and rotate the, the whole structure. The deck that you walk upon is, is held up via cables from the arch. The arch is made of steel and uh, the cables are in tension. And the most important thing when we tilt the deck is that the cables have to remain in tension so that it pulls the deck with it. It's a very carefully engineered piece to make sure that the deck and the arch stay in the same relationship to each other. So it's actually remaining in balance when it's tilted. The bridge is powered by hydraulic rams which push and when they push, they tilt the bridge. It's as simple as that, and yet as complex as that, because on each side of the river, the rams have to be coordinated, and they're coordinated to within fractions of a millimetre. Three 55 kilowatt hydraulic pumps on each side of the structure help to create the tilting motion. These pumps are housed within machine rooms at the end supports and controlled by a sophisticated computer system to ensure that synchronization of the ram extension is precise within 10 millimeters between each side of the bridge. If the measurements were out by just a fraction, the whole system would fail. The bridge takes just four minutes to open and close in operational wind speeds of up to 14 miles per hour. Once it gets past the center of gravity, the rams actually then have to hold the bridge. So the bridge is open for very little power. That's, that's what makes it unique. During opening, as the bridge's center of mass moves across the pivot point, the loads within the cylinders change to accommodate the shift in weight. When fully open, the cables between arch and deck lie perfectly horizontal. The idea of the rams engaging and the bridge tilting is theater, so that's all open to the public, and you can stand and look down and start to see how that works. Construction of the bridge began in 1999, dredging the riverbed to prepare for piling. A dry area was needed to lay the foundations, so temporary watertight enclosures called coffer dams or caissons were used to keep out the surrounding water. Two concrete foundations were then built within them. Back on land, the curved form of the structure began to emerge. It is a very complex shape. Watson Steel, who did a fantastic job of creating that vision. Because whilst on the outside is a very simple structure, Inside these steel boxes is a whole array of stiffenings and framing which keep the whole bridge together. The engineers completed one side of construction, but the other side of the bridge had to mirror their calculations. We got the south side complete, measured where that was, and made sure that the north side was the right distance away, but also in the right alignment. So we didn't try and make two separate sides and hope they would fit. We constructed one and made the other side fit one side. Fabrication of the steelwork was on land at the subcontractor's yard. The arch was made in nine sections, while the deck comprised of 13. The original plan was to pre-assemble the elements close to the site, then pull it all into place with four separate lifts. But in order to reduce the amount of work on site, a lift-in-one scheme was proposed, a bold move that involved using the largest floating crane in the world, a 3,200-ton giant called the Asian Hercules II. The bridge was delivered in a single piece, on a single day, within a single blink of an eye. November the 20th, six o'clock in the morning, a very crystal clear morning. On that day, I was standing everywhere. To see this thing from different vantage points was, was a, a, a great delight. The crowds that came to see that event were just uh, amazing. Lots and lots of people uh, came to see the new bridge being built. Very exciting. And of course, it also required some incredibly accurate construction to make sure that as it sailed up the river, those six miles and got here, the two parts connected together. And it was put down onto bolts that had a tolerance of plus or minus three millimeters. It's very, very precise and therefore very nerve wracking. 
I remember specifically when the Asian Hercules came down with the bridge, because I was standing on the bank behind us on the south side of the river in Gateshead, and you saw it actually floating down, and you couldn't believe it because it was towering above the buildings around us. In a breathtaking moment, this 1,000-ton structure had to be positioned precisely. There was no room for error. When the bridge was delivered, it was dropped onto the bolt. I was standing right next to the bolt as the pre-drilled hole slotted over the threaded rod. It was a moment of epiphany, actually. Everything that had gone before coming together in one moment. When the bridge came along, we were two mil out on the length, and we were only uh, less than a millimetre on alignment. So well done to the engineers. An incredibly emotional experience, actually seeing anything that you've actually created being built. Engineers are usually quite passionate people. They, they, they create things, they enjoy creating things. Uh, to see it actually coming into position in one single event is unusual, actually, because most bridges emerge in time. Very few sort of arrive in a, in a single day and appear and sit in their, in their context and landscape. So in that sense, it was unusual, but all the more exciting for it. It was a spectacular day, a very memorable day, and certainly one I won't uh, ever forget. Newcastle and Gateshead had three chances to celebrate their bridge. After it was installed on the 10th of November 2000, then nine months later when the opening mechanism was up and running. And as a fitting tribute to this record breaker, on the 7th of May 2002, the Queen officially opened the world's first tilting bridge. It's quite intriguing, isn't it? It's fascinating. How can these lumps of steel and concrete actually create something which is, is uplifting? It's created a place where people want to come and dwell and take in the riverside, which is a beautiful place. For many years it was uh, derelict and abandoned, and the bridge, as part of one of a series of projects, has opened that up and allowed people to access the waterfront again uh, and enjoy it. Not only has it become this iconic image, that everybody's aware of, but it also has delivered the links that we wanted between Newcastle and Gateshead, and it continues to win awards as well. Bridge designs, including Gateshead, suddenly made people wake up and become alive to the idea that these were important structures and that their town and their environment could be affected by good design. Not only has the bridge created a lasting legacy in Britain, it has also influenced other designs throughout the world. It's just one of those jobs that you're involved with that you'll never happen again. You know, it's just once in a lifetime, and to be involved in it has just been the pinnacle of my career. The future of bridge building is exciting. As our urban environment grows, the demand for bridging is also going to grow. Perhaps what Gateshead shows is the, the excitement of, and the potential of the future. The modern tools that we have to create things which are dramatic, beautiful within themselves and rather than just functional is there now. We can use those tools to create these marvellous objects, these marvellous bridges around the world. Sky Bridge in the picturesque highlands of Scotland is another groundbreaker in bridging Britain. Its arched girder pushes the free cantilever method with its incredible 250 meter span. On average, other cantilever bridges only stretch to 120 meters. Sky raises the bar, spanning the equivalent distance of three and a half jumbo jets to create a crossing that changed the landscape forever. Scotland has a long history of radical bridges. The most famous is the fourth rail bridge, with its cantilever structure spanning an incredible two and a half kilometers across the perilous Firth of Forth. Since the 1930s, several attempts had been made to build a bridge connecting mainland Scotland with the Isle of Skye, but they had all fallen through, and ferries remained the traditional means of transport. But by the late 80s, it was clear that the ferries were struggling and the locals were paying the price. In the summertime, there were fearful queues sometimes, there was one very bad summer when the small ferry boats were, were not adequate at all, and people were waiting up to eight hours to get across. It probably is the case that there's hardly any family on Skye which had not suffered uh, at some point in their history due to the fact that uh, in bad weather, helicopters can't land or they couldn't get somebody off the island or a doctor couldn't get to the island or an ambulance couldn't get to the island in time. Despite these problems, with a population of less than 10,000 people, the remote Isle of Skye was always considered too small to justify the cost. But that all changed in 1989, when a private finance initiative was introduced, making the construction possible through a toll scheme paid for by the public. 
I mean, what was absolutely clear when we were consulting about the bridge was that the majority of people in the area wanted a bridge, uh, but it was also clear that they didn't want to pay tolls. Now, bridge tolls are not a new concept. Several other bridges in Scotland also had tolls on them at the time. Um, but, of course, that, that becomes a, a burden for those who are using the, the, the bridge very, very regularly, the residents of the island in particular. People were very angry at the time. They felt we were basically being blackmailed. And we took the view that uh, the money could have been found through public funds if the will had existed. Unfortunately, the only realistic prospect there was of delivering the bridge then was to, to provide it by private finance, otherwise they would have had to wait 20 years. Eventually, a competition was launched, throwing the gauntlet down to bridge designers around the world. Ultimately, the winning design came as a result of a unique Scottish-German collaboration, which brought the best brains together. Miller and Dividac had cooperated in the past, and uh, they came together, uh, off offering the Scottish component and the technical expertise. And ultimately, we offered two alternatives to the Scottish office. The bridge had to span a huge distance of over 250 metres without damaging the environment, so extensive studies were carried out. Discussions concluded that the broad water surface, bare mountains and expanse of sky could accommodate a large structure, but it had to be the right one. For a span of that length, there's only two methods that you can use. One is a box girder balanced cantilever design or a cable stay. So it's a straight choice between these two forms of construction. In this case, the box girder was not only economical, it was probably the better solution in terms of its visual appearance and its impact on the rest of the surrounding environment. Sky Bridge is a 250 metre central span, pre-stressed concrete, hollow arch girder bridge. And it's constructed from the piers in what we call the free cantilevering method, which means balanced cantilevers of the bridge deck coming out from either side of the pier until they meet at the bank or in the centre. This bridge was something special because it's a very narrow carriageway, so that makes it a very, very difficult structure to design because, of course, you have torsion forces due to wind and you have a very, very, very thin, small section in which to absorb these forces. The design and concept were unique, but construction had its challenges. There was no road access to the site, so materials had to be transferred from the offshore yard by landing craft and lifted with tower cranes. Work began in July 1992 with the excavation of the foundations. We built them in a dry dock. They're 17 metres diameter and 13 metres high. And they were actually floated in like big, big cups and sunk with the tide onto a pre-prepared foundation. So we actually excavated rock underwater, prepared the foundation, and then sunk these big pots down and then filled them with concrete. The big pots are cofferdams or caissons, watertight chambers similar to those used in Gateshead, which pump out the surrounding water to keep the construction area dry. The piers were created inside these caissons each one containing a staggering 1,800 cubic metres of concrete. Finally, the deck was built using the free cantilever method. Temporary concrete piers were erected on the edge of the caissons so that when the first sections of deck were added, the T-shaped table would stand firm. The free cantilevering then started from each main pier. 53 segments of deck were added incrementally every seven days. These segments eventually extended in perfect balance until they met in the middle and were connected together to form an arch. I remember exactly the last closing segment and I was actually on the deck when the last one was poured. And that's quite a, that's, that's quite a moment, I can tell you. <laughs> that's quite a moment. <laughs>